All right, for some of you that uh, attended our quarterly training in November, you're gonna recognize the face there by the Be Ready Utah logo, that's Brian Stinson. He's an employee of the Utah Department of Emergency Management. He did a great job with personal waste management back in November. And one of the hot topics that was recommended by some of our district uh, leaders was uh, water management. So I asked Brian to come back. We're gonna give Brian 45 minutes or so, and uh, I'm gonna have you take it away, Brian. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. Let's uh, get my PowerPoint going here. Okay, everybody see that? All right. Well, um, one thing we've learned coming into this uh, next year, we have had a really, really dry winter. And we're expected, uh, hearing from the National Weather Service, we're expected to have a, a, a pretty bad drought this year. So I guess uh, that, that goes uh, well into this topic of, of water storage and treatment, even though um, this is something that you wanna have stored water even if it's not a drought, but let's, let's hop into it. Okay, the first question, why is water so important? It's uh, one of, it's one of the, the main things that we talk about for emergency preparedness. Anybody wanna chime in and say why you think water might be an important part of emergency preparedness? Ryan, I'm not seeing any hands up. Okay. So they have to raise a hand. I have to allow them access. Oh, here we go. I got one. Hang on for a second. Okay. Philip, I just unmuted. Go ahead. Philip, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, we got you now. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So I think you can stay, you can survive uh, three days. Is it three weeks or two weeks without water? Or you can, you have to have water with within two, two days or three days, but you, can go two weeks without food or something like that. So yeah, water's the first thing you need. Well, if, if you want to think of the hierarchy of your needs, you can only last about three to four hours in extreme situations without shelter. Uh, you can last three to four days without drinking water yeah. and three to four weeks without food. So great. Yes. Great answer. That's exactly right. Ryan, we've got another hand up. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Debbie, go ahead. So it's important to have extra water in case the power in the city is shut down for any reason or the power on your home is shut down for any reason. Um, over time, it's important to have access to that water for um, sanitation, as well as um, drinking, cooking, cleaning, just extra water is always a good thing to have on hand. Exactly. Yes, very much so. Yeah, there's some some city plants, depending on uh, your your system, they do need to have power to pump the water into your home. So it's possible in an extreme situation without power, you might lose your water as well. Uh, some 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 places it's a gravity fed system, but uh, that's something that you can. You can talk with Paul about to see what, how your city set up. But uh, we are, our bodies are 60 to 70% water. So it's literally what you're made of. You need it to live and for most, uh, if, for all of your bodily functions. So how much water do you need? That's something that I usually get that question, well, how much do I need to store? Because I only live in a small apartment or I don't have much room for storing water. water. How much do I need? If you want to think about it, the average American uses between 160, 116 to 220 gallons of water a day. Most of it literally going down the drain. Now, you know, that's, that's talking showers, baths, flushing, washing clothes, doing dishes, uh, washing your car, watering the lawn, we really do go through a lot, lot, lot of water. So how much do you really need? Well, it go, comes down to if you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated. So that's not a good indicator. How do you know if you're getting enough water? 
not to be graphic, but the best indicator is actually your urine. If it's clear and it's plentiful, you're probably hydrated enough. But if you don't go very often and there's some color to it, you need to be drinking more water. Um, actually, one, one person uh, was just talking about maybe one thing we can do in this upcoming drought is maybe cut back on the amount of water we drink. That's actually a bad idea. There's a lot of other places we can cut back on water before you cut back on the water you drink. You need to always make sure that you're drinking plenty of water. So just a rule of thumb, it's recommended that you have a minimum of one gallon per person per day. That's a half a gallon for drinking and a half a gallon for food preparation and for sanita sanitation. But like I said, this is a bare bones minimum. Have you ever actually tried to live on only one gallon of water a day? It's a very, very difficult thing to do. If uh, you live in a high altitude, like here in Utah, we're average about 4,000 feet, we might need to drink more water than those that live at sea level. You also need to have more for children. You need to have more for the elderly, maybe if somebody's sick nursing mothers, pregnant uh, mothers-to-be, and those who are physically exerting themselves will definitely need to drink more than a half a gallon of water a day. So you wanna store, again, minimum a two-week supply. So how much is a two-week supply, bare bones minimum, for one person? 14 gallons. Okay, so let's say you have a family of four. How much water do you need to have to have a bare bones minimum supply? That comes out to 56 gallons. That's again, that's bare minimum amounts of water for two weeks for a family of four is 56 gallons. If you think about it, that's roughly close to those, uh, the standard 55 gallon blue barrels that you see. You can get those a lot of different places. That's a, that's a good option for storing water and, and covering yourself for about two weeks for your family of four. I recommend that you store more than a month of water or a month plus. Um, again, we, bare bones minimum is two weeks, but you wanna have more than that because you can't live on, you, you can't live without it. There's a few th things that negatively affect your water storage, things like UV sunlight, ultraviolet sunlight, temperature extremes, and contamination. So let's talk about sunlight first. How does sunlight affect your water storage? Well, it breaks down the integrity of some of your water containers. It causes them to become brittle or to leak. Your standard 55 gallon blue barrel that we just talked about, indirect sunlight, if you're storing it outside, it can start to fall, about, fall apart within five years. So it's best to store it someplace that's not getting direct sunlight. Uh, sunlight also causes algae to grow. You wanna limit that sunlight or even any light as much as possible in your water storage areas. Sunlight, if you remember uh, in your biology class, photosynthesis causes algae to grow in stored water. It doesn't really pose a health risk but I know it's not fun to chew your water before you drink it. You don't want to do that or sift it through your teeth or something like that. It's, it's just kind of gross. So temperature extremes is something else that can break down the integrity of your containers. Um, that also promotes bacteria and algae growth, just like sunlight, warm storage temperatures can pr promote those to grow. They also loosens the seals or break the containers. It's not necessarily just cold or just hot, but it's the extreme back and forth, back and forth of freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing that loosens those seals and causes your containers to rupture. So you wanna lim limit those extremes in temperature in your story area, storage areas as much as possible. Oh, we already talked about that. Contamination. That's something else that you wanna worry about when you're storing your containers. That can come from unclean water, getting your water from a non-municipal source, uh, like maybe well water or from the, the, 
the ditch that runs behind your house, those are not good sources of, of drinking water. Your non-municipal sources could be lakes, streams, um, or springs. Generally speaking, municipal water is safe and ready for long-term storage. So that's where you wanna focus on storing your water. You might have unclean containers, pre-used containers uh, for water storage, you know, something maybe you, you bought it online, you found it at a garage sale, you inherited it from uh, Aunt Mabel, wherever you're getting those, you wanna make sure that they're very clean. Um, Sometimes we, we get pre-used containers that had food in it from restaurants, soda pop, juice bottles, those kinds of things. You can use those, you just need to make sure they're very clean. Don't use any, oh, sorry. Don't use any containers that were never meant for food, that uh, you'll never get the contaminants out of there and you could make yourself sick. Okay, um, you wanna make sure that to keep contamination out, use clean practices when you're filling or opening or closing. You wanna use a clean hose to fill up your water tank, not just the, the garden hose that you water your roses with. You wanna have clean lids and clean seals. Don't touch uh, with your hands, direct touching with your hands, at least not uh, you know, dirty hands any of the tools or anything that you're going to be using to transfer the water from its source to your containers. And sometimes where you store the water, it might be unclean there. If you store it outside, there could be dirt, dust, all sorts of other things. If you store it in the garage, all sorts of possible contaminants there as well. So be careful when you, where you store it. Contamination can come from lots of things like protozoa, bacteria, viruses. Those are all different kinds, different kinds and different sizes of uh, microbes. There's chemicals, heavy metals, and sediments that can also be in, in your water. Uh, that's the kind of stuff you get from non-municipal water. So you wanna treat it before you store it or before you use it. Let's talk a little bit about different kinds of water storage containers. There's a lot of different things. Some are better than others. This is one that uh, many of us use. I, I use them. It's a, just your commercially bottled water. It's a popular option for water storage. It's pre-bottled. It's very convenient. It's ready to go. It's a great size for carrying. I actually, um, years ago, used to uh, kind of, kind of poo-poo those people that would, this would be their entire water storage. And then where I lived, we had a pre-boil water, uh, situation. You had, we had to pre-boil pre the water before we could use what came out of the tap. And I thought, well, I'm ready. I've got my big storage water cont containers. That was really not an easy thing uh, for a short-term couple of days to be using my big storage water containers. We found that these bottles are great for that. If you're, if you're just needing it for a short term, uh, the downsize with, with these is they have about a two to three year shelf life. So I wouldn't use them as my sole source of water storage, but they're great. Um, and you know, you go camping or you, you take them for lunch, just make sure you're rotating through your supply, but they are a good, good use of water or a good use of water storage. Uh, they do take a lot of storage space relative to your large, larger water containers. So that's a downside for them as well. They tend to be a little bit more expensive than just pulling water from the tap compared to just your, your municipal water. And sometimes, uh, realistically, bottled water is just bottled tap water that uh, came out of somebody else's tap. One other thing, the FDA holds bottled water to a lower standard than the EPA does for municipal water. So believe it or not, uh, your bottled water is not always as clean as tap water. Now let's talk a little bit more about pre-used containers. They're okay to use if no other option is available. You wanna make sure that you thoroughly wash and clean it. 
uh, clean, safe, pre-use containers with a ratio, this is one, something you may want to write down, a ratio mixture of one teaspoon of unscented, non-colored non bleach to a quart of water. So that's one teaspoon to a quart of water. That's a cleaning solution. That's not a uh, solution for, um, for making the water safe to drink. This is a, a much more toxic cleaning solution, but it's a good ratio for that. You wanna swish it around inside your container, make sure the cleaning solution contacts all the interior surfaces. You want it to let it sit for 30 minutes before emptying it, and then you wanna rinse it with fresh, clean water. Some say to use warm, soapy water. Uh, I know FEMA says to use warm, soapy water to rinse out your containers. That's okay. I've just found it sometimes difficult to get all the soap and the soap flavor out of the inside of the storage container. So I wouldn't use it for like the big 55 gallon barrels or anything like that, but it'd be fine for if you're using two liter soda pop bottles. Um, in, inside those uh, containers, there's going to be residual food deposits and things like sugars that can promote bacterial growth. So be careful with that. Other things you wanna think about is like in the picture there, I've got a, a vinegar container. It's, it's safe once you've cleaned it all out, but you're never gonna get that vinegar taste out. I know one guy, he told me that he got a 55 gallon barrel from a restaurant or somewhere, and he found out that it had been used to store pickles. So his stored water tasted like pickles, which is okay if you like pickles, but I don't like to drink pickle juice. So just think about what was in there beforehand. If it's food grade and you get it clean, it's still probably gonna have a taste and a smell. One thing you do not wanna use, again, like we said before, is don't use containers which held chemicals or any other hazardous substances. You'll never be able to get it clean enough uh, that it'll be safe to use. Some like to use containers like the, the bleach or laundry detergent for storing cleaning uh, water, maybe sanitation water, you know, that's okay. Just make sure, sure, sure that it's labeled as not drinking water and, um, one other thing you want to consider is if you're limited on space, don't store water that you can't drink because you can always turn drinking water into sanitation water. You just can't turn sanitation water into drinking water. So if you're limited on space, just store the drinking water. Uh, plastic containers, that's usually what people think of when we think about storing water. They're easy to find, they're affordable. You can find it most any emergency preparedness stores, uh, some of your outdoor, outdoor stores. I know a lot of grocery stores have sections of, uh, that carry uh, from the, the five gallons there's the 55. Sometimes I've seen at the box stores, the, the really large um, 250 plus size containers as well. Nice thing about them, they're lightweight and durable when they're empty. An empty 250 gallon water tank weighs about 80 pounds. That's not easy. You know, that's, that's the really big one there. Let's see if I can turn on my fancy laser pointer. Okay, so that's, this is the 250 gallon here. It's about 80 pounds when it's, when it's empty. You can fairly easily handle that by yourself. Two people can very easily handle it. One thing you want to think about is when it's full, it's about 2,000 pounds. So it's got to be on a ground floor and uh, you want to think about where you want it before you fill it. Um, solid colors, they block light. A lot of people choose blue because that identifies it as, hey, it's drinking water. Some people choose, like maybe if you've got it in your garage or something where the neighbors can see it, maybe they like to go with a different color. So maybe it's not as readily identifiable as, hey, Bob there has 250 gallons of drinking water and I'm thirsty. 
I don't know, whatever you want to do, but I do recommend solid colors over the more white colors, just like we talked about before, blocks light from getting into your containers. You want to have a high density polyethylene, HDPE, plastic number two. That's on your containers, they should have this symbol and that identifies it as the HDPE, high density polyethylene. There are other plastics that are safe to use for drinking water, like your, uh, we talked about the, the little plastic bottles you get from, from the store. Those are a number one, and those are fine. They're just not intended for long-term water storage. If you're thinking long-term, HDPE number two. Do not use milk jugs, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. They quickly break down, they become brittle. I've had a lot of people that tell me, oh yeah, we used milk jugs because they were really inexpensive. But uh, a couple of years after we filled them up, we went down to our storage room and all we had was a bunch of contain um, empty containers on the shelf. They're designed to break down. The, uh, you also wanna think about uh, I, can't, I can't pronounce this, but it's phthalate. It's, some, it's, a, it's a chemical that's in plastic that comes from some plastics. Uh, polyethylene water and food storage containers are specifically designed for safe long-term use with food and water. If there is any kind of leaching into the water from the container itself, it's so minuscule it can't harm you. That is not the case for milk jugs. So the HDPE that I talked about before, that is safe. Milk jugs, not safe. Okay, and I think we can move on from there. Glass containers, I've got an ant that she stores water in her empty canning jars. That's okay, I recommended to her that if she's going to do that, store them on the bottom shelf. Nice thing about glass is it's not as permeable as plastic. Oh, this something, I, back up to the plastic. Plastic is semi-permeable. Uh, air can pass through it over time. That's why you want to store it in some place that uh, doesn't have chemicals or smells in the room. But glass doesn't have that problem. But of course, what's the problem with glass? Glass is breakable. Um, store it on the bottom shelf if you're going to do it. It's not a good idea for a portable container for glass containers. But if you've got glass jars anyway, if you want to fill them up with water when you're not putting your pickles in them, that's okay. But glass is not recommended. Now, what about metal containers? If you use metal containers, you want to use stainless steel. Some people like it because you can boil your water in the container. You want to be careful with that. Uh, make sure that you know that your container can be cooked in because some have a protective plastic internal coating that is not meant to be heated. Downside with metal containers, they're expensive, they can be heavy. Some of them leave metallic taste in your water. There's a possibility of rust. For long-term water storage, I don't recommend it. I do have a water bottle right here that's metal, but it's just my you know, you know day to day drinking water. It's not for long-term storage. Things you want to think about when you're filling um, and think about these before you place your container and fill it up. Talked about before, use a drinking water hose. A lot of times when I first filled up my water storage, I just used a brand new garden hose. You don't want to use an old one, um, but even a brand new garden hose that you buy from the store, it's not meant for drinking water. But Brian, I still drink out of the garden hose to this day. Yeah, I know, I do too as well. But that's not intended for long-term storage. Your, those, those small contaminants that are in the water, in the drinking ho water hose, uh, if they get into your long-term storage, they can grow and, and get worse. Um, so at worst, garden hoses add contaminants. At the least, they can give your water a rubbery taste. So I recommend a drinking water hose, they're usually white. Um, they're, they're called, you can find them at RV stores, you can find them at boat stores. Um, 
just called municipal drinking water hoses, drinking water hose. What there's there's a many different brands. They're usually white. You don't need to retreat municipal tap water. It's already been treated. It's ready for long-term storage. If you're putting more chemicals into it, you're just putting more chemicals into it. A lot of times our municipal water, you can smell it and it already has that chlorine smell to it. Again, don't retreat it. Retreat, don't retreat the water. You're just wasting your money. Fill it to the top, get as much air out as possible, not just for having as much water stored, but you wanna make sure that uh, the gaskets that are keeping it airtight are kept moist. You don't want them to dry out. If they dry out, you lose your tight seal, air gets in, contaminants can get in. So get as much air out as possible. Some other things to think about with storage consideration like where and how are you going to store it? As in anything that you're storing, you wanna keep it cool and dark. Actually, sometimes add on keep cool, dark and dry. Anything you're storing and you wanna keep for a long time, cool, dark and dry. But how do we keep water dry? Well, you keep the outside of the container dry. Uh, you wanna prevent algae and bacteria and the container from leaking. And that's cool and dark, best storage considerations. Vary your container sizes. You can see there I've got, again, the 250 gallon tank. I've got a 55 gallon here, a five gallon, and then just some one liter uh, juice bottles as well. Why do we need to have large containers and small containers? Well, the large ones here are your best, most efficient use of space, but they're difficult to move. The smaller ones here, like the, the 55 gallon, or I'm sorry, the 55 gallon, that's still 450 pounds. That's not moving either. But the five gallon here, it's probably about 45 pounds when it's full. So that one's something you can move easily. These smaller ones, you know, 10, 15 pounds, they're easy to move. What I recommend is having different size containers so I take these up to the kitchen, the restroom, wherever I need water and when it's empty, then I bring it back to my large containers and fill it up with there. These are the ones you can dispense easily from wherever you're going to be using your water. Don't store it directly on the concrete. Uh, water condensation or spills, it promotes that microbial growth, which uh, creates a talk which creates toxic gases and remember I talked about plastic is semi permeable those gases can pass through the walls of the container and uh, leach into your water. So if you elevate the container off the ground it allows the moisture to evaporate. Another thing to think about concrete also emits toxic gases when you elevate it allow you, when you elevate it, it allows the gases to dissipate rather than be trapped underneath. And again, eventually pass through the semi-permeable wall. You see there, I have some two by fours. A lot of times people say, well, I'll just throw a sheet of plywood underneath. That's not as good because well, the, the two by fours here allows air to be able to dissipate underneath. Whereas you're not just trying to elevate it off the concrete, you're trying to allow air to pass underneath it. So I recommend two by fours over just a slab of uh, plywood. Uh, other things you want to think about were storage locations. And this is kind of an overall thought for emergency preparedness in general. Uh, there's ideal, and I'm teaching you the ideal, but then there's really what we can do. There, there's budget, there's time, there's storage space, and a lot of different factors determine how close we can get to that ideal. We want to get as close as we can there, but I don't want you to get discouraged and give up. Uh, you do what you can with what you have. Adapt to your circumstances, your needs, and your abilities. Remember, something is always better than nothing. So maybe I don't have a drinking water hose. Okay, use the garden hose, but maybe you need to treat your water after you use it or taste it and make sure it's okay before you 
or take a take a test of it before you use it. But a, a lot of times I talk to people and like, yeah, I, I got a 55 gallon barrel, but I just haven't filled it up. It doesn't do you any good if you haven't filled it up. Remember, something is always better than nothing. So let's talk about where should we store our water storage? I recommend multiple locations. You know, maybe upstairs under the bathroom sink, maybe in your basement storage room. Goods and bads both ways. Let's talk about the ideal. The ideal is indoor somewhere. Like I said, cool, dark, and dry. Maybe in a basement, a food storage room, someplace that's climate controlled. That is the most important factor for long-term storage is cool, dark, and dry. But maybe you don't have a basement. A lot of people don't. Okay storage, maybe in your garage, a storage shed, maybe under a sink. You want to be aware of the proximity to possible con chemical contaminants, like I talked about before, plastic being semi-permeable. Don't store it directly on the ground. But again, this is much better than nothing. Maybe a last resort outside. If that's the case, you want to prevent as much sunlight from reaching it as possible. So maybe cover it with a tarp. Uh, keep as much contamination off of it as possible. Store it on the north side of your house rather than on the south side where it'll get direct sunlight. You'll need to rotate your water a lot more often. Probably if it's outside, you need to rotate it every six months, probably in the spring and in the fall. You don't want to fill it to the top in this case. Maybe leave a little room for expansion from possible freezing and, and heating. And remember again, don't store it directly on the ground. So how often do you need to rotate your water storage? Well, there's a lot of different thoughts on this. FEMA and the Red Cross say rotate it every six months. And I think the reason they say that is because that's just an easy blanket statement that if you do that, you're safe. But depending on how you store it, where you store it, uh, what you store it in, you may, need, you may not need to rotate it that often. If you keep it cool, dark, and dry, like we said, in a clean, airtight, food-grade container filled with correctly treated water, it could easily last five years or longer without rotation. Now, the USU Extension Office, they did a study on it, and they said that if it's properly stored, you shouldn't ever have to rotate it. So if you have those ideal conditions, if you can do that, you may, USU Extension says you don't ever have to rotate it. You, I would recommend, even in ideal conditions, to check it yearly. Check for odd smells, discoloration, maybe check for leaks. Be careful when you are checking it not to introduce contamination when for checking for contamination and then replace it if necessary. Okay, what about other sources of water? If, what if you've used up all your stored water? What about house water pipes? How do you use that? There's, there's possibility of quite a few gallons in your pipes. If there's some kind of an emergency that happens, earthquake, that's the one that we usually talk about. One of the things you want to do when you're going and checking maybe for a gas leak is shut off the incoming water main um, if you suspect water lines may, might be contaminated. If, if there's an earthquake, it's a good idea to just shut them off anyway, because that protects the water that's already in your home from con getting contaminated. Don't turn, back, don't turn the water back on until you're told that uh, the incoming water is safe. Now, how, to how do you dispense that water? You open up the highest valve in your home, maybe the upstairs bathroom sink, and you dispense it from the lowest. Maybe the lowest one is the water heater in the basement. And that's, that's where you'd get your water from. When you open up the one up above, that allows air to get into the system and it allows it to come out. Talked about the water heater. If you're going to use the water in your water heater, Again, shut off the incoming water supply, shut off the gas or the power supply as per your manufacturer's directions. Make sure that you cool it before you dispense it, and then you can dispense it and drink. 
What about the tank behind the toilet? Of course, we don't use what's in the bowl, but you don't even want to use what's in the tank behind the toilet because there's all sorts of chemicals and stuff there. So maybe if you had to, you could use that for sanitation purposes. But uh, yeah, just use it for sanitation. Don't use the, don't drink the water even behind the tank. Another option, canned fruits and vegetables. Use this water in food preparation to spare your drinking water. So maybe fruit juices, you could use that for making breads and cookies. You could use vest vegetable juices for soups and pasta. Don't, I mean, that's usually the stuff that we dump down the drain, but you can use that in place of your drinking water. What about pools, hot tubs, and water beds? I remember, if, has anybody ever seen that show? What was it? Is it on the National Geographic channel, I think? Uh, it was called Doomsday Preppers. Anybody ever see that? I remember there was a guy that was on it and he said, I'm prepared for an emergency because I've got a hot tub in my backyard. That's all the stored water that I would ever need for drinking. Well, that's not really the case. Uh, do not use pools and any of those things for drinking water. The chemicals are almost impossible to, to remove with consumer grade water treatments. You're never going to make that stuff clean, clean enough to be able to drink. You can use it for sanitation. You can use it for washing. Don't drink it. What about other sources of water outside the home? You know, lakes, rivers, streams. Uh, you can find places outside. Always choose the cleanest source of water. Uh, they, they tell you, the, any, any farmer or uh, cowboy will tell you, drink upstream from the herd. But remember, there still might be another herd further up the stream that you're not seeing. So any outside water, make sure you treat it. Maybe snow and ice. Yeah, you can use those. Make sure you melt it and treat it before you drink it. Same thing with any other outside source of water. Make sure... Make sure you melt it. That's an important thing. If you are eating snow directly, especially in an emergency situation, melted snow will rapidly drop your core body temperature, and that could be deadly if uh, if it's not a uh, if you're in an emergency situation. Always warm it up to liquid before you drink it. Uh, you can drink rain as well. Again, as in everything else, make sure you treat it beforehand. Um, one thing you may want to be careful with is a lot of your roofing material is not safe. So that, that stuff that's coming out of your, uh, your downspouts might be a really hard thing to treat, but you know, that's, that's an option. Uh, and after a disaster, depending on the disaster, there could be debris in the air that's captured in raindrops. I know that we had a, a, a rain, uh, snow here about a week ago and everything where I live down here in, in Utah County was just covered with looks like white paint. All the cars, everything outside looks like it was covered in white paint because that snow rain that came down, it was just really, really, really dirty. So you don't just put your head up and ah, you got to treat it first. What about things like fountains, golf courses, uh, golf course water traps, fish ponds, drainage ditches? Are these good sources of water? Nope. Again, there's, they're so full of fertilizers and pesticides and chemicals. You, you're contaminated. They're so contaminated, your commercially available treatment is insufficient to make those safe to drink. Again, you can use them for sanitation, but nothing else. It pretty much comes down to if there's an outside source of water, even if it looks clean, treat it. Don't just drink it. Okay, let's, that's some, we talked about storage, we talked about sources. Let's talk about some water treatment. There's a three part process, I'm just about out of time here, but three part process for treating your water. And you could even add on there a, uh, a, 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 a part zero, choose the source, the cleanest source of water is your first thing. Just a second, I need some water. 
Okay, very first thing, choose the cleanest source of water. Then you have a pre-filtration, filtration, and purification. Let's go into some detail. Start with pre-filtration. Okay, like I said, choose the cleanest source of water. Things you can do, just scoop out the chunks. Uh, is, is your fancy water filter that you, you got from the outdoor rec store, is it gonna filter out that stuff? Yes, of course it will. But it's also designed to clean out those, mic those microscopic things. So preserve the life of your filter by scooping out the chunks. Um, it saves money and saves your filter. You can also let the particles settle to the bottom or collect at the top. Uh, after, maybe if you, after you scoop out the big stuff, filter it through a cloth. You can use cotton, cheesecloth, maybe a t-shirt, anything that's clean to pour the water through. Have a container to catch the pre-filtered water. And remember, this is only a pre-filter. This is not yet ready for water. You can see that going from this jar here with the sediment still in it, going through the cloth, that's still pretty cloudy water. It's much cleaner than it was, but that's a much easier thing to put through your filter than this muddy, cruddy stuff up here. Okay, so step two, filtration. Filtration is actually a physical barrier. If you can imagine like a gate and the water passing through the gate. And the, the quality of your filter depends on how close those bars are together. The closer the bars are together, the, the less uh, large particles can pass through. Okay, so usually they're measured in microns and the lower the micron level, the smaller the particles and the organisms that are trapped. On this, you can see there's uh, so what happens is your water, it passes through this outer barrier this, this, this happens to be a ceramic filter. So it passes through the wall here. And this looks like a, a activated carbon core. And it goes through the activated carbon and dispenses out the bottom. So that's the way this style of filter works. But there's all sorts of different kinds of filters. Uh, the one that I, you just saw, it was uh, these for the gravity filters. Uh, here's another kind of a gravity filter. Um, uh, those just work by gravity. Some of these other ones, they work by pumping. Uh, here's a water bottle style. Here's another pumping style. These are really popular with backpack backpackers. This one here and this one here, they're more of a straw style of filter. You stick one end in the water and as you're sucking on it, the water is drawn through the filter and it comes out clean. So, Whatever kind of filter that uh, you wanna use, I recommend different kinds for different situations. Something like this would be great for your disaster supply kit. It's small and lightweight, but would be insufficient for at home. Something like this mul filters multiple gallons at a time. It's convenient because it just sits on your countertop. Uh, maybe if you're in the car or something, you may wanna have a larger, if you're with a larger group, something that you can, uh, pump the water through, something like these style here. Okay, uh, depending on the filter, they can remove chemicals, sediments, protozoa, bacteria, and heavy metals. One thing you wanna think about, most filters do not remove viruses. That's not as much of an issue here in North America because we don't have a lot of viruses. We don't have an issue at all with viruses in our drinking water. But when you go and get the filters, consider your needs, your abilities, the number of people you're supplying water for, the poten potential sources of water, and the potential contaminants in your area. Now, what about these awesome, cool activated carbon filters that uh, you can buy at the store and they uh, make your water taste a little better? That's mostly what they do. They make your water taste better. They're not designed for removing microbes uh, content, potential contaminants like that from your water. They, they remove heavy metals. They can remove chemicals from the water. The way they, they work is they have activated carbon in it that actually absorbs those things as the water is passing through the activated carbon. By themselves, activated carbons 
again, are insufficient, they're inadequate for removing har harmful microscopic organisms. Okay, purification, different kinds of purification. First one we're going, uh, the difference between purification and filtration. Filtration removes things from the water, uh, but it doesn't kill anything. Purification does not remove anything from the water, but it does kill everything that's in the water. So let's talk about heat purification first. That's usually the easiest way. Uh, heat purification, it requires fuel. Your your, it might be scarce in an emergency situation. So you wanna think about that as well, but it's as simple as like boiling water. Uh, you want to have a boiling, uh, rolling boil for three minutes at Utah's average elevation. Um, you go on to most websites and they say boil for one minute, but that's at sea level. Utah, average elevation of 4,000 feet, you're talking three minutes. Higher than 5,000, you're going to have to go longer than three minutes, sometimes uh, seven minutes or maybe even up to 10, depending on how high you go. Uh, a lid on the container, it'll help the water to boil faster and prevent loss from evaporation. Again, boiling does not remove anything from the water. So your sediments, chemicals, heavy metals, and salts will remain if they were not already filtered out. Distilling is another way. It's a little more effective than boiling. It's a lot more effective than boiling because it actually, the water separates itself, itself from some of those uh, things that would be left behind. So it's a heat process, but since the water's moving itself, removing itself from those contaminants, uh, it's, it's cleaner than just boiled water as well. Uh, here's, here's kind of a makeshift distiller, distiller you can make. You need to have some kind of a concave lid that you can turn upside down and let the drips drip into that can or a cup and then uh, let that water cool down. I'm sure there's all sorts of uh, distillers that you can make. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, during prohibition times, a lot of people knew how to do that a lot more than they do now, but essentially this is how you can do it. Okay, we talked about heat, heat purification. Let's talk about chemical purification. Any kind of chemical purification closely follow the manufacturer's directions on how to use their products. One thing I remember using from Boy Scouts was iodine tablets. Uh, iodine, uh, it, it works okay, but it's susceptible to heat and light and moisture. It has about a four year shelf life in an unopened bottle. If the bottle is open, it only has a one year shelf life. Iodine comes in tablets or drops. One thing you want to think about it, about iodine, it kills all organisms like viruses and bacteria, but does not kill the larger organisms like protozoa. Protozoa are just a little heftier and iodine is insufficient to kill those. If you use it in conjunction with a filter, then, then you should be okay. Another thing, bad thing with iodine, don't use it longer than a few weeks straight. It's only meant for short-term emergencies. And do not use it at all if you're pregnant, if you have an allergy to iodine, or you have a thyroid problem. So only use it for a few weeks. You don't want to use it longer than that. And some people don't want to use it at all. It's not my favorite thing to use. It kind of makes the water brown and a little smelly. There's, there's other things that are more effective and less stinky. One of those is just your normal sodium hypochlorite liquid bleach. And the way you do that is you add dro eight drops of uh, per gallon. The Red Cross website says to put in 16 of them, but Clorox says to use six drops. I guess Clorox, actually, they have increased the uh, intensity, the, the, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, it's, it's more... Condensed. Concentration. Concentrated. There you, there you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So anyway, if you're using the, the concentrated Clorox, they say you can you only need six drops. But what you do is you, you you put those eight drops in if you're using just standard sodium hypochlorite liquid bleach. Again, no 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 chemical or no perfumes, no uh, dyes, anything like that. Just straight bleach. 
drop the put the drops in stir it wait for 30 minutes there should be a slight bleach smell to it if not treat it one more time with another eight drops and wait 30 minutes again if there's still no bleach smell then the water is too contaminated Ah, uh, a downside with, with sodium hypochlorite bleach, it has about a one year shelf life. So you, you can't use the stuff. I mean, you can use it. It just won't be as potent after one year. And it may not be effective again against larger organiz organisms like protozoa just by itself. But if you use that in conjunction with a filter, you should be okay. Now, some people talk about using calcium hypochlorite or dry bleach. Um, it has a longer shelf life than liquid bleach, but it's difficult to use to get the correct concentrations. You've got to use like pool water testing equipment uh, to get the right parts per million. This is just really not good stuff to use. We don't recommend using it. If you really want to use it and you say, well, I'm, I'm going to do it anyway, you've got to talk to the manuf manufacturer about how to use it properly for drinking water. And again, by itself, it's not effective against protozoa. So I, I don't recommend using dry bleach. One, I've, one that I really like is chlorine dioxide. Chlorine dioxide, a lot of municipalities use it for doing uh, water treatment in their water treatment plants. Uh, has about a five year shelf life. It comes either in a liquid or a tablet. Uh, liquid treats it a little bit faster, but it's a little more difficult to mix two chemicals together and let it sit than to just drop in a tablet. A tablet has about a four hour processing time. I use liquid for at home treatment and a tablet for, I, I have the tablets in my disaster supply kit and when I'm out backpacking. They're, they're just really convenient. It's iodine and chlorine free, even though it says chlorine dioxide. Really what you're doing is you're like hyper oxygenating the water and uh, it, it releases a, a nascent oxygen, which is a strong germicidal agent. It's significantly stronger than iodine, yet it's safer in correct doses in drinking water. It doesn't discolor the water. It doesn't give it an unpleasant taste. In fact, a lot of uh, it's used to improve the taste of water by neutralizing unpleasant flavors. So chlorine dioxide, I give it two thumbs up. As with all of these, you need to be very careful how you handle it. You can see in the picture there, you never touch the tablets. You only touch the, the packaging. You never wanna have it come in contact with, with your skin. Just with everything, follow the manufacturer's directions. Okay, so here's our little to-do list. So you wanna put ready to drink water in all of your emergency kits, your disaster supply kits, maybe your work school or daycare emergency kits. Put ready to drink water in your car emergency kits and your first aid kits. I like, uh, you can see the, these pouches here. I like those in my disaster supply kit. And then I have uh, an empty hydration pouch in my disaster supply kit as well for when these are used up, then my other source of water, uh, if I find another source of water, I can fill this up and put my purification in there. And then I actually have an inline filter that goes on the hose. So it's, it's purified in the bag and it goes through the hose and is filtered as I'm drinking it. All right. Put your water treatment supplies in all emergency kits. So I talked about having stored water in your kits, have water treatment as well. So this is, this is a filter that I have in my disaster supply kit. I also have some of those chlorine dioxide tablets. Store as much water as possible and practical. Uh, again, large containers are better use of space. Smaller containers are more portable. So store as much as you can. Secure your water heater. Not only does it prevent a gas leak, but it protects a valuable source of clean water, maybe as much as 40 plus gallons of water. Practice water conservation. In an emergency, supplies of clean water are going to be very limited. We talked about uh, this could be a, a bad drought year. 
in an emergency, if there's a, an emergency during a drought year, it could be really bad. So practice water conservation, learn different ways of saving water. You know, you can do something like a sponge bath rather than a tub bath or even a shower. Sponge bath takes much less water or, or a washcloth. What, learn to wash dishes by hand. Uh, if you can do that, you're using a whole lot less water. Uh, learn to wash your clothing by hand. That's something that uh, very few people have done nowadays with the convenience of our, of our washers. Teach how and when to turn off the main water and other utilities. Every responsible person needs to know these life-saving skills. Again, right after an earthquake, assume water lines will be contaminated. Shut them off until you hear otherwise. Shut your gas off only if you see here or smell a leak. Something to practice, don't use the plumbing for a weekend. Is you ever done something like that? What worked? What didn't? What did you learn? I've learned when I did it, I learned that it's, it's very, very difficult to live on only one gallon of water a day. So it convinced me that I need to store more than just 14 gallons uh, per person in my family. Some other things you can do is you can go camping. Many basic preparedness skills are learned when you're roughing it. Okay, so remember in a disaster, you don't rise to the occasion you sink to your level of preparedness. I would hope that uh, this presentation was something that helped you all to think about your level of preparedness and give you some things that you can do tonight. Well, maybe not tonight, but at least this weekend, get some water stored, maybe uh, go looking for some, some uh, filters, some other means of purifying water maybe identify some areas in your neighborhood that might be sources of water. Uh, one last thing that I wanted to do before I finish up, so share the screen with you again. Uh, go to our Be Ready Utah website, uh, it's just bereadyutah.gov. Scroll down and on the right hand side at the bottom is our water storage uh, brochure. You can download that and it has a lot of just uh, quick rules of thumb about water storage, kind of a quick uh, overview of the presentation that I gave tonight. Okay, oh, and there, oh, there was a couple of other things I wanted to do, but we'll stop sharing. Some other, other, other things I'll just tell you without showing you. Uh, follow us on Twitter and on Facebook, Be Ready Utah again. This month, we're actually doing water storage. So uh, if you want uh, some little things that you can do, maybe to share with your friends and family, uh, follow us on Facebook and Twitter and send out our, our little memes and information and links about what you can do to, to have water ready for an emergency. Again, three to four days, that's how long you can last without it. It's very important.